sold to you before it was sold and after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, this is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Amen. Amen. I'd like to pray for Rob as he comes to bring the word to us today. Lord, we ask that you will bless Rob, that you will give us the ears to hear what he has to say. And will you, Lord, help us to really respond to his words? And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Morning, everybody. It's good to be with you. And... Uh, as the week's gone on, I've kind of been dreading uh, this passage a little bit because it's one of those passages that most of us are not quite sure what to do with. A couple dropped dead after being less than honest about their offering. And um, when did that last happen in any church service you and I were part of? Um, before Ananias and Sapphira, we see this a wonderful picture of the life of the early church and the generosity of Barnabas and the sale of his field. And we know that good things are waiting for us after this story. Uh, and Mike's just read that to us, but here it still is. You see, to get to the healings and the rejoicing at Solomon's portico, you still got to pass by Ananias and Sapphira. But still for some preachers, perhaps they love, love thinking that maybe this passage could be useful. It's a bit of a high risk strategy, but if I want my church to give generously at the next gift day, if there's one looming on the horizon preaching this passage on a Sunday, might just do the trick this will put the fear of god up them uh, you want to lie to your leaders about your giving not cool uh, look what it says here give generously give sacrificially give all you can and more or die uh, well maybe wouldn't say that but maybe risk uh, bad stuff happening it stirs us it unsettles us um but it's to miss the point of the story ananias and sapphira we are told we're free to sell their property or not sell their property. They were even free to keep the money from the sale or free to give it away. What they should never have done was simply to lie about it, to give the appearance of doing one thing while actually doing another, to boast you have given everything when in fact, with fingers crossed behind your back, you've kept back some for yourself. Maybe they felt they'd earned it. Maybe it's been a tough few months for them, even a tough few years. They'd held on to this uh, property for all these years, a little nest egg, and now it's time for them to enjoy something of the spoils of their patience. Perhaps they thought they deserved a treat. No one will ever know. It's just the two of us conspiring together discreetly, secretly. And maybe if anyone ever found out, they could justify their actions, make them appear wise and sensible, find a way. Of, of showing why they were good stewards of their money. 
despite the fact that they knew it was full of falsehoods and lies, even before God. You see, it's not about money and property. It's about the integrity and trust as Christian people that we have and being free, being truly free, set free by the spirit of God, set free from the power that money and property exercise over those all around us, free from the power of Satan himself, free from whatever it was that motivated Ananias and Sapphira to do what they did. But it is a story about death. It's a story about sudden death. And so first Ananias, he brings the offering, places it at the apostles' feet, just as Barnabas has done. Perhaps he's in the same queue was just, uh, that Barnabas was just in. And maybe he was sweating, maybe he was shaking a little, perhaps, maybe nervously twitching, eyes darting back and forth. We will never know quite what Peter saw, but Peter knew. And what happens next is just brutal. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the proceeds of the land, as Peter tells him? You see, it was his to sell or not to sell, his to keep or not to keep, to give away or not to give away. But why lie? And Peter then, in sober tones, says, you mustn't worry about what I think. What you need to really worry about is what God thinks. And then that was it. Before Ananias could even reply, he collapses, eyes rolling, hits the ground and he's gone. Did God really just kill him for lying about his offering? Or maybe it was a heart attack. We just don't know for sure. The text is silent. We assume we think we might know. All we do know is that he is dead. But also that the day is far from over. Peter gives instructions. The young men come forward, wrap up the body, and before the final offering for the day is counted, he's been buried and the young men are on their way back. And no one has told his wife. And three hours later, she walks in unsuspecting, maybe trying to look all innocent. Had anyone not thought to tell her? And Peter stands there, sorrow in his eyes, a piece of paper in his hand. He looks at her. Her husband's already dead. Pastoral care naturally, instinctively says, we really ought to deal with that for us. But not today. Is this what you got for the sale of your land? He holds out the piece of paper. She sees the number. It's the one she was expecting to see. It's the one they discussed. It's the one they decided to settle on. Big enough to look believable, but less than the actual amount, of course. Hopefully, people will just assume it was a tough sale and they had to settle for less than the market value. That's right, she says. That's the amount. And maybe at this point, Peter pauses for a moment, gives her the gift of some silence to think about what she's just said. Perhaps her conscience will kick in. Perhaps she will break down and confess. But she doesn't move. Nearly there, she thinks. Hold your nerve. They'll never know. Well, time's up and Peter speaks. Why? Why did you agree together to put the spirit of the Lord to the test? You did this together. Why? So senseless, so unnecessary. Do you hear that noise at the back of the church? They're just coming back from burying your husband. And you are going to be next. And she falls to the floor and is gone. And by the time the sun sets that day, the church membership roll is down by two. Is it any wonder great fear sees them? Gift days would never be the same again. And it is an awkward story for us to have to face. It's brutal and it's violent. It's got all the stuff we struggle with, money and property and sudden death. Sudden death in the presence of God and his people. Judgment upon the household of God. Some churches are obsessed with money and giving. Other churches, not so much. We're not quite sure what to make of this story. And it feels perhaps a little unjust, disproportionate, 
They held back some of the sale of a piece of land and lied about it. Okay, they shouldn't have done it. But they didn't kill anyone. There's no adultery here. Does it not seem a little over the top under the circumstances? And what does it mean for us today anyway? When was the last time you heard of an unexplained death on a church gift day? Maybe some obscure story that did the rounds some years ago from a distant church, but really? In Hearn Hill, in any church you've been part of? There's surely plenty of people who have given the impression of great generosity when in fact their motives were mixed, holding back some of what they knew they should give. Billionaires are lauded for their extraordinary generosity. And yet, in fact, they are the meanest people on the face of the earth. And that's why Jesus warns the rich, especially about their money and their possessions. Because you see, unlike the poor, they have the power to appear generous when, in fact, their hearts are cold to the cries of the poor. What must I do to be saved? The rich young ruler asked Jesus. Or sell all you have, give to the poor, and come follow me. And the young man went away sad because he was very rich. Jesus has warned us. But there's something familiar and natural to us about Ananias and Sapphira's story because their world is our world. It's the world of billboards and advertising, balancing generosity with entitlement, enjoying the good life now but with just enough generosity to give something away if and when there's something left over. Just a few pounds for good causes, they tell you, but what they know you really want is the jackpot of millions because that will be yours and will make you so happy. The 2008 financial Christ, uh, crash, in the end they discovered that the one thing you cannot control is greed. Pure and simple, you cannot legislate for greed. And we live in a world that plays to our greed and our envy and our security, persuading us that what we have is never quite enough. We need a little more, always just a little more, justified in our selfishness. Now, there's a nasty little advert that's recently doing the rounds on television. I don't know if you've seen it. Well, I think it's nasty anyway. It's one of those property sales website adverts. All you need is your postcode. You put your postcode in and it tells you what your house is worth. There's quite a few of these around, but this one's an advert that's appeared recently on the scene. Now, I've got nothing against us finding out the prices of our houses and selling them and wisely investing and managing our money, et cetera, et cetera. But it's the setup of this advert that bothers me. If you've seen it, you'll know what I mean. Starts with a, a couple in a room, a mock interview, always a couple, here we go again. And one version of the, of the uh, advert has an older couple, another a younger couple. And one of them is talking to the camera about how much they love their home and they love their neighbours and they love all the memories that are tied up in this place. Well, meanwhile, the other one has found this website, put in the postcode and voila, big money. And they subtly lean over and hold in front of their um, partner, their husband, their wife, um, the sum of money that they, find, that they found that their house is now worth. Eyes widen and faces changed. And in that moment, friends and neighbours become enemies. Precious memories are emptied of their power. It's all now about the money. It's all about what you're financially worth. To hell with life and love and families and friends and communities and neighbourliness. In the presence of big money, greed takes over. You can see it in the advert. And it violates the sacredness of our homes and the beauty of our friendships and the warmth and security of the living communities that we inhabit and we participate in. And so they lie to the interviewer and before God. Well, we never really like them. And we never really like this house. And we're off with our wallets full of the money. Uh, that we've been told we're entitled to. This last year has forced us to ask some tough questions and it's also taught us many things. Some of us have discovered who our real friends, friends are, those who stuck with us. And some of us have made new friends, introduced to people that we never knew previously. We've got to know our neighbours and been humbled by the generosity of many around us, some of them with little else to offer. 
And some would say humanity has been restored and life has broken out once again. Somebody shared a tweet yesterday by Martin Rowe. I have no idea who Martin Rowe is. But he said, let's make sure that the new normal is more than a vaccinated version of the old normal. Amen to that. I'd like to think it would be so, but I'm not so sure. Greed and envy and coveting your neighbor's field are powerful forces in our world. Most who have any power to change our world refuse to believe there is an alternative, trotting out lie after lie, persuading themselves and persuading others. The greed is okay. They just don't call it that. I hope I'm wrong, but I'm not so sure. And then there's the church. You see, this difficult story of Ananias and Sapphira is sandwiched between two glorious pictures of the church. In the first story, we see the extraordinary community freely redistributing their possessions and their wealth wherever there is need, so that before long, there was not a single needy person amongst them. It's an extraordinary statement. Spirit-filled believers, baptized in the spirit, giving generously and freely so that there is no one amongst them with any more practical need. And in the story that follows Ananias and Sapphira, we are told of great signs and wonders. None dared join them, and yet many came amongst them. The sick were brought and were healed. Those tormented by evil spirits were set free. Everyone longed just for Peter's shadow to fall across them. The God who brings life and salvation was with them, had broken out amongst them, and they lived. A community now restored and strengthened. The memory of Ananias and Sapphira, Sapphira now growing ever more distant. But one final curiosity of this story is that it is the first time that the word church has appeared in the book of Acts. Luke has waited until chapter five to use the word church. It will appear, of course, many times in the following chapters, but here it appears for the first time. It's tucked away amongst the stories of Barnabas, the story of Ananias and Sapphira, of Peter, of Solomon's portico in the streets where you find the sick. It's tucked away amongst the towns surrounding Jerusalem. And now, says Luke, I can start to tell you about the church. The church was and is and remains a mixture of faithfulness and foolishness, simple acts of extraordinary generosity and love can be found alongside acts of image management with confused and conflicted thinking. In the end, I'm glad that Luke has included this story because it's my story, it's our story. It speaks of the things that I wrestle with, many of us wrestle with, all of us from time to time wrestle with. It graciously warns us and challenges us. It speaks to our humility, to our trust, worthiness and our truthfulness and in the end we stand before God who has graciously given us all things in Christ and we are free we are free to live and free to love we are free in the midst of the old order of things we are free to live in the new reality that has broken in in Christ we are free to live to love to give This is the church and this is the kingdom. And we have been set free in Christ to shine as lights in the darkest corners of this world, of our world, of our neighborhoods and of our communities. And whatever the next few weeks and months hold for us, we cling to this one simple truth that in Christ we have been set free. The world has no hold on us. Satan has no hold on us. We reflect the glory of God in this world forever free. Amen.